Um, can I give a show of hands how many of you have used Spark? One. That's a lot. Um, so the first part might be a little bit boring for the ones that are putting up your hand, but the second part is probably more interesting. Um, how many of you have done so research projects based on Spark? Or actually, maybe um, how many of you are so you consider yourself academic researchers? The uh, and the rest are industrial. Put up your hand if you are. Okay, interesting. So it's more actually industrial. Uh, research. How many of you consider yourself industrial researcher versus engineer? So engineers, put up your hand. Researchers. So we got a really interesting mix. If uh, maybe that's just the KDD crowd here. Um, okay. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic over to uh, Doug. So Doug actually is a director of um, training at Databricks. Um, in his normal job, he actually talks a lot of the Databricks customers that are delivering training for our customers. So um, this is also going to be a fairly interesting uh, crowd because it's a lot more, I would say, uh, technically savvy and um, academic than the normal crowd that uh, Doug delivered training to, and we'll see how it goes. Um, and then we have actually Tim Hunter coming over from, uh, he's currently not here, but he'll be here before for his talk, to talk about uh, machine learning pipelines. So he um, got his PhD at UC Berkeley a um, couple of years ago and was working on, uh, with Peter Abiel on AI. Um, one of the, and then we have Michael Ambras who got his PhD at Berkeley a while ago um, with Mike Franklin working on database um, query optimizations. And then uh, I'll give the last part of the talk about the engine internals. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass the mic over. Excellent, so how, how are you guys hearing me okay? Good? Excellent. In the back, too? Thumbs up in the back? There you go. All right. We got thumbs up in the back. Perfect. So again, uh, just to recap, uh, wow, this is a massive audience. This is really exciting to see that uh, Spark 2.0 is uh, such a big deal. So um, what we're going to be doing is the first half of this, we're going to really get into with hands-on coding Joyride using Spark. So we're going to look at all the different aspects of Spark using Spark 2.0. Um, oops. See if that video comes back. It's the uh, one downside of using the Lenovo. Uh, the Lenovo is used micro HDMI and the cable comes out really easily. So uh, we're going to start out with really just an orientation, a code and joyride of Spark itself. We're going to do a little bit of uh, simple machine learning to begin with. And then in the second half, after we've really just gotten comfortable working with Spark and all of its engines and how Spark works, we then going to hand it over to the researchers who are going to go much further under the hood. So they're going to talk about the different data parallel algorithms that Spark is working with under the hood, how it actually scales. Uh, Michael will talk about the Catalyst Query Optimizer, which is what makes Spark incredibly fast, amongst many other things. And Reynolds will talk about the Spark execution engine and the underlying memory management that makes Spark incredibly fast. So with that said here, let's go ahead and get started. Um, and to get started, I first want to uh, just do a quick poll. So how many of you guys uh, know Python? All right, how many of you guys know Scala? Okay, so the Python has it for the purposes of this uh, tutorial, which is kind of what I expected at the data conference. Um, so we're going to work with Python. How many of you guys have already been working with Spark at some point? How many are working on Spark 2.0 right now? Much fewer, excellent. So we'll have a chance to look at what's new with Spark 2.0 as well. Um, and lastly here, uh, we want to get everybody set up on the lab environment. Are you guys in the front able to see these screens okay? You know what I can do? Uh, I'm going to go to join.me and I will launch a screen share. And it'll update very slowly. So while we're waiting on the screen share, here's a link to the doc that I have up on the screen right now. tinyurl.com slash spark dash kdd dash 2016. So if you go to that URL, you'll get to this doc. And this doc, I'm going to be putting links to any other docs we're working with. It's also got the agenda. So tinyurl.com slash spark dash kdd dash 2016. 
And let's see if I uh, join me launched yet. No, not yet. Okay, we'll have to wait. <laughs> yeah, I think we've flooded the internet capacity of the room. So what I would ask is please avoid any large file downloads. So I will make sure that I upload the presentation slides. Please wait till after class to download them. Uh, because this, if, if we're going to do the hands-on coding joyride, the most important thing will be that we actually are able to get to the cloud platform. And the cloud being the cloud requires internet access. How are we doing on internet? It just kind of went out on us, didn't it? Uh, media people, do we have wired internet for the uh, speakers table? If not, I'm going to go with my backup plan. Um, and the backup plan will simply mean that you guys will have to do some of the coding on your own and it will be more demo based with me on my Wi-Fi hotspot. And that's just what we do. So let's see here, click, connections, mobile hotspot, tethering, Turn it on and put it in the window. Do you guys not have permissions to view this doc? Correct. We have to request it. You guys, it should say anybody with the link can edit, so it may just take a refresh or something like that. You're in? Okay. Hmm? Well, I do want them to be able to edit in this case because further down, there's a section here called questions and answers. So, for example, you know, uh, we could have a question from Luke. So let's put this to normal text. Question from Luke. What is the force? Answer from Yoda. Life creates it. Makes it grow. Luminous beings we are. <laughs> and because we have such a big group, how do you spell Leia? L-E-I-A. Perfect. So you guys are welcome to put in questions. And if other people like your question, then I'll go through, or some of the, uh, my co-presenters will go through, and we'll actually start adding answers to these questions. And the really interesting questions I'll also try to highlight up here from the podium as well. So this is a really great way to keep it interactive when we've got such a large group, because you can imagine how quickly we could get derailed. So with that said here, um, I think uh, the internet is going to be somewhat unforgiving. Let's find out by getting started. And I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my personal hotspot. But don't let anybody do that or else uh, the cell networks will be out next. <laughs> all right, lots of anonymous people all editing. Is there a way to turn that off? <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, but we do want everybody to be able to edit and add their questions towards the bottom. So uh, let's see here. How many of you guys are doing data science on Spark? How many of you guys are doing uh, database query work on Spark? How many using Spark in production? How many want to use Spark in their classes? Like you're a professor, you want to use Spark in your classroom, you have your students start doing big data. Excellent. What about in your research projects? Okay, so so far I have not hit the big bulk of the room. So how else are people, uh, what are the other interest areas here? Just you want to know what Spark is. You've heard about it and you want to know what's the big hoopla. What's the big loop about Spark? No. Perfect. This is very good. So let's go ahead. We still have people filing in, but let's go ahead and get started. So uh, those of you who do have internet, there is an opportunity for you to do some of these exercises with me. Um, I'm going to assume that the internet is just not going to be working in a room this full that we've saturated the Wi-Fi bandwidth. Uh, we managed to saturate the Wi-Fi bandwidth with a quarter this many people at the Databricks offices. Um, but after class, you can go to community.cloud.databricks.com and start using Spark immediately. Zero setup. Now, to be fair, Community Edition is free, so you're getting a very small amount of resources on Amazon EC2, about 0.8 of a CPU. 
So it's, it's a big data platform at a small scale. And then you swipe your credit card, and then you can get bigger scale by getting Spark Enterprise, or DataBricks Enterprise Edition. Or you can download the Spark from Apache and install it on your own clusters, however you wish. Now, I'm going to go ahead and get started on these slides here and really just introduce what is Spark. So I've got a real short presentation here, Spark A Coding Joyride, which is really intended to be an orientation on Spark. And initially, I'll look at Spark 1.0 just from the perspective of this is what people know, and we're going to move quickly into 2.0. So in this presentation, this is the first hour, we want to look at Spark's ability to rapidly process very big amounts of data. And so we're going to look at a number of the different aspects of Spark. The first part of Spark is really what's at core inside the engine, which is what we call resilient distributed data sets. It's an old idea giving completely new life in big data. Uh, it was part of uh, Matei's PhD thesis that got the best uh, PhD dissertation award from the ACM, I think in, what year was it, 2014 or 15? When did Matei actually sign his thesis? One of those years, okay, fair enough. We're then going to go in and we'll look at a layer of abstraction above RDDs. So RDDs are going to be this very simple memory management, resilient distributed data set layer that allows us to process big data in a resilient way but the API is very much functional programming. It's hard to use. And we said, you know what? We need a better API. So we're going to look at data frames and in Spark 2.0, data sets, which make the API much easier for people. We'll then play around with some features of Databricks for visualizing and plotting data. And we'll create a machine learning pipeline to process our big data. And we'll also look at what is it that made Spark 10 to 100 times faster than Hadoop MapReduce. So me, this is uh, each of the speakers will get a chance to introduce themselves. So uh, I'm the director of training at Databricks. So I do the initial must learn Spark. And then we bring in the PhDs to go into the really academics. What are we doing to really make machine learning at scale? And how does the Catalyst Query Optimizer work? But I also like to introduce myself as a person. I always think that uh, the other half of the equation is equally as important. So uh, I enjoy sailing and rock climbing and snowboarding, but I haven't gotten to do any of that because I just got married and we now have a four-month-year-old kid. So this is really exciting. Thank you. <laughs> it's still adjusting, though. I'm, I just realized I'm having to grow up as a parent. <laughs> it's a whole new uh, shift in the world. Let's get these uh, monitors back on here. It'll take just a moment. And of course, my one guilty pleasure that I do when I still have time is play chess badly. So we've already checked how many of you guys were new to Spark. So let me just raise this question. How many of you guys have never used Spark? All right, that is the bulk of the audience. So this is perfect. And then how many of you guys have been using it for a year? So significant portion of the audience. I'd say about two dozen. It's just a huge audience. So let's talk about the problem that Spark is, first of all, trying to solve. So what are the goals? Well, the, first of all, we want one unified engine to process data. The big data, first big step of big data is how do I store big data? So we had things like Cassandra and Big Table and HDFS. Huge amounts of research. How do I store and organize big data? And then came about the compute wars. And when it comes to the compute wars, you've got Hadoop for MapReduce. So Hadoop being taking Google's MapReduce, which of course takes other academic ideas of MapReduce and parallel programming, which were developed decades ago and are finally getting life now that Moore's Law has switched from being the speed of the CPU. Instead, we're just adding transistors to it in parallel and we're growing the number of transistors that we throw out a problem. So it's about processing big data. So in Spark, we want a unified engine to cr process data across a variety of data sources, whether it's coming from a Parquet file sitting on HDFS, Hive tables, Cassandra data stores, standard relational databases, tab-separated values files, Amazon Redshift, which is their big database, or other 
big data storage formats. We'd like one engine that can process data across many different data sources, many different workload types, whether it's machine learning or ETL or visualization or ad hoc exploratory data analysis or data lakes. And environments. So let's look at each of these in turn. So first of all, Spark itself, we've got Spark Core, the underlying engine underneath Spark using these resilient distributed data sets and the tungsten engine. And then above that, we've got a number of different higher level of abstractions built in. How we do one on the screen here, by the way? You guys able to see this okay? I can always zoom in a little bit. I can launch my zooming tools. And let's see if join.me ever launched. Try that again. I can get, there we go, now it's updating faster. It looked like it hung before. Once we have join.me, I'll be able to have you guys see this on your laptop screens. Can you point to the slides? Huh? Where are the slides? Well, so I don't want people downloading the slides because you're going to saturate the Wi Fi even worse. So um, I'm going to do a screen share instead until, and I'll let you download the slides after the session. I think that's the best thing to do, given the uh, Wi-Fi saturation. Uh, that's a good question. Would join.me make it better or worse? That is a legitimate question. Um, so if you do want to download the slides, um, well, this, this is a legitimate question. Let's find out how the join.me is doing first. Um, join.me slash Doug Bateman, one word. Oops, no, that's not true. Let's go back. It's going to make it really bad? You've tried it? Okay. You think doing the slides is better. All right. So if you want to download the slides, go to tinyurl.com slash spark-kdd 2016 and scroll down to where it says file share. And there's this link here. That needs permission. Oh, that's where you needed the permission. Got it. Okay. So I will go there and give you guys permissions. Say again. Slash KD, no, slash spark dash KDD dash 2016. And I'll put that back up again here in just a little bit. Meanwhile, let's give everybody permissions. So anybody on the web with a link can view. Try now. And we're looking at spark according coding joyride dash main. Say again? The URL again. One last time here. You want to grab a pen and write it down as well or get it from your neighbor. But it is tiny, let's see if we can get that to come up. Tinyurl.com slash spark dash KDD dash 2016. Tinyurl.com slash spark dash KDD Dash 2016. The presentation that we're currently looking at is a coding joyride main. And so you would scroll down to where it says file share here. And then you get to the file share and it is spark a coding joyride dash main. And I have a feeling it's going to take you guys a while to download. So let's keep rolling and talking about it. By the end of the presentation, hopefully everybody will have downloaded it. All right. So we've got our core Spark engines. One engine, Spark Core, which is now able to work with SQL queries, with the Catalyst Query Optimizer, streaming data sets through a process known as micro-batching, machine learning, so parallelized data parallel machine learning algorithms, and even graph processing using Pregel, parallelized Pregel algorithms running on GraphX, and it has a newer API coming out called GraphFrames. 
And so we've got a variety of different APIs and modules that come on this. And we've also got support for Scala, Java, Python, and R. For this group, we're going to use Python, because it looked like 90% or more of you guys are using Python. So for this presentation, we're going to stick with Python. Sorry, no MATLAB interface for those of you who prefer MATLAB. It's the big debate, right? Python versus MATLAB versus R. <laughs> All right, coming back here, data sources. So our data source could be a relational database, Cassandra, HBase, Columnar Stores, Hadoop HDFS, Hive. So Spark's not replacing Hadoop. It's adopting a lot of Hadoop. It's just replacing the MapReduce component. We could read JSON files, comma-separated values files, Elasticsearch, Amazon S3, Parquet files, Really, any data source out there with an adapter written, we can read. And we want to be able to run on any kind of environment, whether we're running with a resource negotiator like Yarn to manage my cluster, so yet another resource negotiator. I can use Yarn to load very quickly. I create a cluster of 50 computers, run my Spark jobs, and shut them back down. I could do Docker containers. I can run on Amazon EC2. I could run on Mesos and Mesosphere or any of the other cloud platforms out there. The idea is that Spark is really about the data processing and it connects to all these other environments. So I can work with many different workloads, data sources, and environments. And of course, this is a very big project. These are just some of the people that are contributing to the open source project in nature of Spark. So you've got Netflix and eBay and Facebook, NAPR and Datastax, Yahoo, Cloudera, Novartis, and this list is growing. Capital One should be added to the list, and so on. Let's turn off this. There you go. Nice and thematic, though. So you can just look at the size of the user community just by looking at the commits. This is a 2015 slide, but just looking at the commits in the past year. Very active and growing and thriving project. Largest cluster in 2015 was a Tencent in China. 8,000 nodes. Largest job was run by Alibaba and Databricks. One petabyte. I believe this record's been broken now as well. Top streaming intake terabyte per hour. And Spark won the 2014 on-disk sort record, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. So in 2013, Hadoop had the on-disk sort record. They used 2,100 specialized machines with a high-performance network in between them, taking 72 minutes to sort 100 terabytes of data. 2014, Spark grabs a 207 machines, and it takes only 23 minutes to sort 100 terabytes of data. So an order of magnitude improvement, and it's the first time anybody won this competition in the public cloud. This was on Amazon. So what is the basic structure of Spark? Well, the first thing we want to look at is really what is our Spark structure? So Spark works with the idea that Spark driver is where our application runs. When you launch Spark from a command line shell, you're bringing up the driver. All of the coding that you do in Spark, you're really coding and sending to the driver. The driver, think of it as the quarterback. It controls the entire processing of jobs by breaking the job up into tasks and sending those out to the executors, each executor has a number of available slots. The documentation calls them cores, although you, the number of slots really is independent of the number of cores of the hardware. Sends them out, and each of these executors is capable of running these tasks. Now, to understand this a little better, I'm going to open up this picture here on RDDs, just to understand a little bit about what's actually happening under the hood with Spark. So I'm going now to the RDDs section. 
So take a look here at an example that I might be building up. So the first thing is I might have a log file with a bunch of error messages, info messages, warning messages, maybe terabytes and terabytes of log file that I want to process. And I'll read this in from HDFS. So notice in this case, one block of HDFS is becoming one partition of my resilient distributed data set. At this point, I can start doing operations on this data. We call those transformations. So this is why you see Optimus Prime here. He's a transformer. So we do transformations. So in the case of RDDs, we're really doing functional programming. I'm going to say, run this function on each row. And if it returns true, keep it. If it returns false, throw it out. And so I might end up, with, now I end up with a new RDD, a newly created RDD, that only contains the rows where my filter function returned true. We're going to actually code this up in a little bit. You'll see this with live data very soon. Then I might go further and say, you know what, currently I have four partitions. I'd really like to only have two partitions. No problem. I can coalesce another functional operation here. And eventually I say, show me the results. I'd like to see the results, gather up the results, and send them back to the driver. That's what collect does. So we can only collect if the results at the end are small. And small enough to fit in my driver. Otherwise, I could save them out to a data store somewhere. But I call collect. Now, here's what's really important. Nothing in Spark will run until you say what to do with the results. It's lazy. So until I say send the results to the driver or save the results on a file system over here, nothing will run. And this is hugely beneficial because what it means is Spark can now look at this entire processing pipeline and optimize it. And we'll look at some of those optimizations in a moment. So at this point, I call an action to bring it back to the driver, and that's when it executes. And so what we have here really is a directed acyclic graph, which is just simple terms for data flows downstream. There's no cycles. Data never flows back upstream. Directed acyclic graph, a DAG. I'm going to execute the DAG and bring the results back to the driver. And this is the core underneath of Spark, right there. So at this point, it's going to read from a text file, filter the data, coalesce them, and bring it back to the driver. Now, this is not a particularly great example of a job. There's not a lot of benefit to coalescing immediately before collecting. Uh, you could argue that that was a silly job. But this is very fundamental to understanding what's really happening inside of Spark. So we've got this life cycle here where we build up the DAG, and all this is being built up in the driver. Then we call an action. At that point, work gets sent out to the executors, divided up along these partitions. Work is sent out to the executors and eventually collected back in the driver because we called collect. Never call collect if you've got terabytes of data, you'll run out of memory in your driver. Then you would just call save to file. Now, the first thing that people get concerned about when they're looking at these RDDs is this. Once I call an action, all of a sudden, all of this intermediate data, all that memory is released. So what happened is it ran this entire pipeline. And in this case, I just called count and said you had five rows. And then it turns around and I say, you know what, I'd also like to save it to a text file. I'd also like to do some additional filtering and look at those results. This seems horribly inefficient to have to run the entire pipeline every time. And so in Spark, we have the option of calling cache. And we can cache it to RAM, to disk, to RAM and disk. We can cache it in a compressed form, serialized objects. 
Lots of different options for caching. But caching is what's going to allow you to reuse the same data multiple times without having to redo all the processing. So I heard a few people chatting, how do I make Spark faster behind the hood? Intelligent, careful use of caching is what will do it. So if you look at this picture here, did I cache in the very beginning when I read the entire data set? No. I wait till I filter to my working data set the data that I'm really interested in. And .cache will save it to memory. Now if my data set is so big that it can't fit into memory, then it's only going to cache the portions it thinks it can fit into memory. And there's an eviction policy. And what do you do if the data that you don't have doesn't fit in memory? It says, oh, let me recreate that data. How? By rerunning the lineage to reproduce the data. This is what makes it resilient. If I lose a cached copy of my data, I know where the data came from, I rerun the lineage and regenerate the data. So I think I had one person, yeah, question there? Is the optimizer ever smart enough to know that it should cache if it gets Fair question. Is the optimizer itself smart enough to know it should cache? The short answer there will be no, because it's a procedural Turing machine. It knows what the current job is not what the next job is. So it's doing it job by job. Um, so you have to give it some intelligence in caching. Now within a job, yes, there's lots of opportunities to be very intelligent because you've built up a DAG. So it's very intelligent within a job. But it doesn't know what you're going to do next. It's not a mind reader. And so this is where a little bit of the artistry and tuning comes in. It'd be really awesome if somebody came up with a way to look at past execution history and learn what should be cached, because typically you're running the same program over and over and over again. So for those of you looking for research projects, I think that'd be a fun one. And Reynold, feel free to jump in if I, you had anything more to add on that one. OK. All right, so now how does this processing actually work? So let me skip ahead a little bit here. I'm going to jump into a different slide deck, and I'll upload this slide deck just a little bit later. I'm going to grab some courseware slides to go with it. So I think this is one of the really important things to understanding Spark. So instructor files, slides, stages. So to really get what's making Spark fast, you really have to look at the scheduler. And then we're going to do a coding example. So here we are in the scheduler. And the biggest barrier that people have when working with Spark is just the vocabulary. So first of all, we have a Spark application. So this is, I've got a program I want to run. Inside of my application, when I call an action, I'm going to kick off one or more jobs. So every time I say collect, that's a job. It's making work happen in the executor. And eventually, we're going to break down that work into individual tasks that can run on individual executors. So let's look at how that works. So here I've got a Spark application. And each time I call an action, I'm kicking off one or more jobs. Typically one job, but a machine learning algorithm with 1,000 iterations would kick off 1,000 jobs. One job per iteration. So an action fires a job. At that point, it's going to try to break this job up into tasks and scheduling. And to do that, there's a very important distinction we have to look at called narrow versus wide dependencies. So a narrow transformation, that is to say, map or filter, these are narrow operations. And what does that mean? It means if I've got one item of input, it contributes to one item of output. Another way of thinking of it is this way. Here I've got 10 numbers. And let's say my map operation was to square those numbers. Well, I can create a partition downstream of four results. So 
One upstream result leads to one downstream. Compare that, compare that to a wide operation like sorting or distinct. A wide operation, in a wide operation, each parent contribution contribute, each parent partition potentially contributes to multiple downstream partitions. It's a very important distinction when understanding the performance characteristics of Spark, and here's why. Let's back up again. And notice that if I'm, for example, going to do a filter, followed by a map, followed by another filter, I can pipeline all of these and run them on one machine. Oops, my drawing tool is not behaving very well. So I can pipeline and run these on one machine, meaning I read the input data, one executor now has one task that reads the input data, does the map, the filter, the map, the filter, and then eventually spits out a result. Pipelining. And this is possible because I know the entire DAG up front of all the work that you want to do. We're going to look at some coding examples here in just a little bit. But I, given this is an academic group, I really wanted to give you a peek under the hood as to what's making Spark fast. Versus a wide operation. With a wide operation, notice that this guy can't start doing his work until he gathers results from all of the upstream tasks. So we end up creating a stage boundary, and this is known as a shuffle. RDD1 has to contribute to multiple downstream partitions. I've got to send data potentially across the network. I've got to wait for work to happen so I can begin working on that result. And so our jobs first get broken down into stages. So we take our RDD, we define our RDD DAG, we break that up into stages, those stages get broken up into tasks, and those eventually run on the executor. And this is the underlying engine of Spark. It's a rather straightforward architecture, builds on a lot of great work done by the community. And it's just been assembled into one big data processing application. So, great question. So he's saying, what is the structure of the coding, really, when you start doing a job? So here I'm giving you a bit of how the internals of the project work so that when we get to the coding, we'll actually get to relate it to some of these concepts as well. So his question was specifically, like, are you going to be working with RDDs? We're going to start out by working with RDDs, and then we're going to realize this is a painful high-level API, uh, low-level API. We're going to build something above it to do most of this work for us. And those are going to be known as data frames, and they use a query optimizer. You just write SQL, and it's going to come up with the transformations and actions for you. And that will be much easier and faster for a number of very interesting reasons. But to come to your question, what does the code look like if I was working at this RDD level of abstraction? I read my text file. This is Spark 1.x code right now. We'll look at 2.0 when we get to our hands-on. We'll read a text file, potentially from HDFS or Amazon S3 or wherever you're storing it. I'm then going to, for each line of the file, run this function. I'm going to call line.split, and I'm splitting it up by spaces. And I think that should have been a flat map there if I look at it. What do you think, Reynold? If it's word count, it ought to have been a flat map. We can debate that later on. So now I've broken it up into words. And at this point, I could say, 
Give me words who saw, oh, wait a minute. Oh, good. This is by lines. I'm taking each line and breaking it up into a list of words. And I'm throwing out lines that have no words in them. I'm throwing out lines that have no words in them with a the filter. I then, for each word, say I've seen that word once. So I'm going to go, I see the word the once. And then further down, oh, I see the word the again once. Oh, I see the word the again once. And then I turn around and say reduce by key. So this is a very map reduce type operation. I'm going to say, given the first pair, A is our word, and B is a number. Is that right? Words? The word zero is the count, my bad. This is the count. No, that's not true either. That's the word. You are counting word blessing. You are counting the arrow. Like the, uh, you are counting how many times an info appears and one appears. Yeah, no, no, but this, I'm getting tripped up on something. OK, fair enough here. But what I'm doing is I'm going back and saying, OK, now the word is our key. So everything with the word the, I'm going to call reduce. So I'm going to grab all the thes, and what am I going to do? I'm going to say, I, this, are you sure this is right, Reynolds? You're just counting info. Your program is actually right, but you're counting info and warning often. Oh, OK. So this is not word count. I'm, all right, sorry, that was my mistake. I was looking at this as word count. In this particular example, I'm just counting how many times have I seen the info message, how many times have I seen the warning message, et cetera. So I got thrown off a little bit there. Thank you. I'm looking at just the first word on these log lines. Sorry about that, Reynolds. I grabbed, this is what I get for grabbing an old deck just to go a little bit deeper for you guys last second there. All right, so now that we've got our application, what are we going to, what does it do? It takes our application, looks at the transformations, and builds our DAG. Builds our DAG. Once we've got our DAG, we'll take a look at it. And we say, these guys here are narrow operations. So we're going to just group them together as tasks. Reduce by key is a wide operation. So that ends up being in its, so reduce by key ends up being in a separate stage. Once all three tasks of the upstream stage finish, it goes down to the next one. So this is the high level of what's happening with Spark. What I want to do is to make it real and make it real before break. What time is it now? All right, make it real after break. Uh, I said I was going to take a break every 15, oh, 115? 150, good. We do have a moment to do just a little bit of this before break. So what I'm going to do is go to my community account. Um, how many of you guys were able to have good internet now? How is the internet doing? Okay. So what you want to do is go to your community.cloud.databricks.com. Community.cloud.databricks.com. If you've not made your account, you're welcome to make their account over break. So I'm going to get people set up for this. We're going to break, and then we're going to do the hands-on. So if you've not made your account right now, what we're going to do is go ahead, log into community.cloud.com, make your account. Once you've done that, you're going to come here under Workspace, or just click on Home. You click on Home. And you come over here, and you just right-click and say Import. Not right click. You're going to click on this downward triangle and say import. Then we go over here to the URL. And you're going to copy paste this URL from our source doc right here Power Plant Lab. I grab that URL. I come over here under my home directory and say import from URL and I paste the URL and select import and what I get back is our first lab that we're going to be doing right after break. Question? Just sign up. 
you just sign up. Community.cloud.databricks.com. You sign up. Once you've logged in, you go to home. You're going to click this down arrow and choose import, URL, and paste. You're very slow, yes? So we're going to call a 10-minute break right now, go get some water. Are there refreshments around here at all? I think the refreshments are back in the Hilton, aren't they? You guys are welcome to use the restroom, grab some water, coffee shop. I'm going to try to give us a stretch break periodically because I know how brutal these conference sessions get. We're going to be doing programming now for this next part. We're going to actually develop a machine learning pipeline using the engine inside of Spark.